Hey, good morning. This is Jamie with Stonemaier Games, and as usual, every week at this time, 10 a.m. on Wednesday on the Stonemaier Games Facebook Live page, or Facebook page, um, I'm here to share Stonemaier Games news and what's going on with Stonemaier Games, answer any questions that you have about pretty much anything, and uh, discuss some random topics here. I have a lot of random topics today, but some Stonemaier stuff. Let's see, where should I jump in? So I did some recent blogs about uh, a few different topics. Um, I did one about Jackbox the other day. Jackbox is an on, kind of a, a mobile slash online party game platform that we've been using a lot during the pandemic remotely on Saturday nights. And Jackbox does something really cool with t-shirts where if you are using one of the games where you get to draw stuff and you create something fun, right when you finish the game, you can buy a t-shirt with that drawing on it. Um, and so I did a blog post about how, how I think that's pretty clever and the idea of breaking down barriers to entry or, or any barriers when uh, between a customer and something that they want. Um, I also did a blog post about growth versus endurance, companies that focus on growth and getting bigger and more and companies that focus on uh, endurance and survival and just uh, persisting over long periods of time. I used an example from Japan uh, for that blog post. So those are two recent blog posts. I also did one today, one fun one, where I recently asked Stillmeyer ambassadors what their assumptions were about me. This was inspired by some YouTube videos I saw from creators who um, normally don't talk about themselves, but gave their viewers an opportunity to say, okay, what do you assume about me? And I will address those assumptions and say whether or not they're, they're true or not. So I just actually posted that on my personal blog, jamiestegmeyer.com today. So if you're curious about what people assume about me and whether or not those things are true, check out my personal blog. Looks like we have a question from Carlos. Carlos came prepared. He said, I was thinking about the difference between resource management in games like Pendulum, where you move in and out a set of resource cubes from a player mat, and Tapestry, where you have a slider where you move just one resource left or right on a tracker. Um, personally, I prefer the slider option, but what advantages do you see in each method? Um, well, let's see. There are a couple different things here, Carlos. One is from a production standpoint. It's less expensive to make one token of a type, one like representative token for a slider, um, like in Tapestry, than it is to make a bunch of resource tokens. Um, like in Pendulum, or games that even have even nicer resource tokens than Pendulum. Pendulum, they're, they're just cubes. Um, I think one of the, uh, with a slider, you can, you can have that visual of how much you have left. And in Pendulum, it's kind of a countdown almost to the end of each round or the end of your, um, your advancement turns before you need to take an income turn and, and refresh all those resources. So there's a, a countdown element to that. And so having that sliding scale, I think, is helpful for seeing that. The other factor in play, I think, is uh, Pendulum in particular is a is a you know mostly a real time game, a simultaneous action game, and so we thought uh, we were worried about having a slider where you might forget to move the slider because it's easier to remember, I think, to pick up and move resources than it is to adjust the slider, um, and I didn't want also the slider getting bumped and then suddenly it moves out of place. There are things that you can do to prevent that too, but. Um, they add a bunch to the cost as well, and sometimes they're not always as effective as you might think. So those are a few of the things that I kept in mind between those two games. That's a great question. Francesco is uh, a fellow game designer. Francesco is joining me this morning. Tim, a, a developer, an app developer, is joining us. Cynthia from MeepleSource. Um, Matt, I won't go through the whole list here today, but let's see. Francesca, Francesco said, what games did you play this week? Yeah, I played some, some great games this week. Um, most of which, let's say I played, yeah, actually all three great games. I played Luxor last week on um, Board Game Arena. And then I played Rajas of the Ganges, the dice game on yukata.de uh, last week. Both fantastic games. Luxor was the first time. Rajas Dice was, I think, my third time, maybe fourth time. Really enjoying that. And I, did, I'm, I have videos coming out about both of those games. But the big game that we've been playing is Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. Megan and I started playing this on Saturday, and we are all the way through May at this point. So we're about halfway through the uh, the Legacy campaign, and we're really, really enjoying it. I have a video coming out about that, I believe, on Friday. No, no. Uh, Friday is Wings and Oceania. Uh, it's, it's next week will be the video for Pandemic Legacy. Um, so really enjoying that, and I'm also really, really excited. This Sunday, I'm going to get to play a game that I've been wanting to play ever since people started talking about it, uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak. I finally got a copy, and uh, we're going to play this Sunday. I'm so excited to play this. 
We'll see how it holds up against a game with similar mechanisms, but a completely different theme, um, Dune Imperium, which I really, really enjoyed recently. Uh, let's see. Um, Kyle says, I was bummed to get an email about Wingspan delay. Any more information about it than what Joe said in the email? Uh, well, Kyle, so what you saw in the email was that we were expecting to get a shipment of Wingspan um, in our fulfillment center in the U.S., this week, um, ideally even last week, but the ports have been so congested that uh, that the shipment is still at port right now. It hasn't moved through the port in the U.S. And so, as Joe said in the email, we are literally just waiting for that freight shipment to arrive, and um, and it should ship out uh, quite soon. But uh, as you as you know, when you placed the order, we were already saying um, that it was highly unlikely that it would be shipped before Christmas, or at least that you would receive it before Christmas because of how busy fulfillment centers are and the postal system is right now. So I know you're eager to get it. I love that you're excited to get Wingspan and we will ship it to you as soon as it arrives at our fulfillment center. Tommy is joining us from Texas. He says, we have six players who want to play the Rise of Fenris. Is this possible? And what do you recommend? It is totally possible if you have uh, the Invaders from Afar expansion for Scythe. That brings the player count for Scythe up to six and seven players. And then you can uh, you can start the campaign with those with six of those factions and start playing the Rise of Fenris. And do I recommend it? Yeah, I mean, for any campaign game, my recommendation is uh, if you have X number of people who are excited to play a series of games with you, go for it. Um, and hopefully safely play in these pandemic times when it's tough to meet in person without wearing masks. Um, or, yeah, like when we play the, Ma the Ru Lost Ruins of Our Neck this weekend, we'll all be wearing masks. Ilya says, how, uh, how do you think we as a community can encourage more individuals to play games and grow our community? That's a great question. Um, I mean, one side of it is I don't want to encourage anyone. I, I wouldn't want to push anyone who isn't interested in games to play games. That's totally their decision that people have lots of different outlets for the types of media they want to consume and participate in. But I think the number one thing is um, to invite people to your table. And right now that might mean virtually invite them to your table. It might mean playing Jackbox, a party game platform, instead of the normal min middleweight Euro games that I'm used to playing, things like that. But um, finding, finding the types of games that someone else is excited about and welcoming them to your table, and especially that first time that they're playing with you, to focus on their needs and their desires and uh, the types of games they might be interested in, um, the types of themes they might be interested in. Tim says, I hope you enjoy your Lost Ruins of Arnak. He says, we ended up getting New York Zoo and Agricola to start our Uwe Rosenberg collection. That's awesome. Yeah, two wonderful games from Uwe Rosenberg. Um, yeah, really, both are, are, are really fantastic. New York Zoo is probably the easier one to learn, or definitely the easier one to learn of those two. Um, but if you're then wanting to level up and go to something heavier, Agricola is fantastic. That's one of the games that really got me into this hobby as an adult. Uh, we, for a while, a while, we just played Agricola. We got together just to play Agricola for a couple of years, I think. Paul says he just cracked open Wingspan for the first time. That's awesome, Paul. Thanks for giving it a try. Uh, Kriti is joining our live cast for the first time here. She says she has an exam tomorrow, woke up early to study, saying a big hello from Seattle. Well, thank you for joining us for the first time here, and I hope the exam goes well tomorrow. Good luck with that. Let's see, a few random topics. Let me throw out a few random things. Oh, things I'm, uh, some podcasts that I'm listening to or participated in recently. Um, I participated in the Quackalope podcast the other day, and it was an interesting podcast because I joined them not to talk about Stonemaier Games, but rather to talk about Tidal Blades. They have a series on the Quackalope podcast where uh, it's called Played It Once, um, and it's, it's the two hosts and then a random guest who gets on board to talk about a game that they've only played once. And for me so far, that's Tidal Blades. I've only played Tidal, Blade, played Tidal Blades once, but I really look forward to playing it again. Um, and I was happy to talk to them for about an hour, talk to them about Tidal Blades, which is not a Stonemaier game. This is a game from another company that I just really enjoy and was excited to talk about. I'm listening to an NPR, what is this called? Uh, How I Built This, with uh, about Riot Games, the company that made uh, League of Legends. And I also have the newest Secret Cabal episode queued up. I'm excited to, to listen to that. What podcast are you listening to today or this week? I'll jump over here back to questions. Joe says, what's my chocolate of the day? Of course, yeah. My chocolate of the day today, it actually snowed a little in St. Louis today. So I think it'll be 
um, some double chocolate hot chocolate later on today, or maybe maybe this afternoon. Uh, right now I have just coffee with a little bit of mocha in it. But uh, later today, yeah, I think today is a good day for some hot chocolate. Mike says, have I tried the Search for Planet X? I have indeed. Yeah, there's a video about it on my YouTube channel from a few months ago. Really brilliant deduction game from two designers that I really like working with, uh, Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley, who are known for Stillmeyer for the Between Two series of games. Matt says, uh, between er emergent storytelling, like an oath, um, or uh, The King's Dilemma, I've heard. I haven't played that yet, but I've heard that. Uh, basic concepts and players fill out the details. And preset story or choose your own adventure. Narrative stories like Above and Below, the new Vindica Vindication expansion. Which do you prefer and which is more likely to make it into a future Stonemaier game? Um, we ventured into this a little bit, right, with uh, Charter Stone and with the Rise of Fenris. Um, I do... I mean, I kind of like a hybrid of the two. I like to give players the flexibility to tell their own stories from the things they're doing in the game. To give them... And it's tough to do. It's really hard to design around. It really emerges from playtesting to see when players are actually engaging with certain elements of the game, whether they're mechanisms or thematic, to, uh, to tell their own stories. Um, the one thing that I do want to avoid in our games, and we address this in The, in the Rise of Fenris, is long paragraphs of text. Um, I love well-written narrative, but uh, sometimes it's just too much. Um, I, I, I like just a little bit of text because that gives uh, that anchors the story for players but it also uh, doesn't uh, detract too much from the mechanisms and it gives players the room to fill in more of that story themselves. And so uh, that's kind of the sweet spot that I want to hit with. And so in The Rise of Fenris, for example, we had Ryan wrote some beautiful story. So if anyone wants to read the story, the story is there in The Rise of Fenris campaign book. But we also summarized it. So if you just want to start by reading one or two sentences, you can easily do that in The Rise of Fenders. You just read those, those summary sentences, and then you can move on to the setup and gameplay. Mike says, related to his question about the search for Planet X, will we see a deduction game from Stonemaier Games? Probably not. Um, there, I, I do like deduction, um, but I definitely wouldn't put it on my list of top 10, maybe even top 20 mechanisms. If anything, it would be something very subtle in a game, not a game built around deduction. I'm going to look at my other topics here I have on the screen. I'll jump back to questions in a second. So yeah, what I'm working on right now, I'm working on a rule book today. I'm writing a rule book, which I always, I don't dread it. I, I uh, Maybe it's one of those things that I procrastinate a little bit before actually sitting down to write it. But once I'm immersed in the writing of the rule book, I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy adding structure and trying to make a game uh, intuitive by writing the rule book. Um, so I'm doing, working on that today. I'm also working on three different prototypes at the same time. So kind of jumping around between three different uh, prototypes today. I also posted a poll in the Wingspan Facebook group yesterday about the possibility, just an idea, it was really just an idea to see if there's interest in it, of a dry erase score pad or score board for Wingspan. Because uh, we've just, I mean, I've been amazed by how many times people play Wingspan. Um, even though the, I think the, the score pad can accommodate, I believe it's 100 games, because I think it's 50 pages front and back printed. But people exhaust those score pads, and we do include the score pads in every expansion, too. And so I was thinking, you know, actually, this is Joe's idea. Joe said, you know, what if we had a dry erase option where someone could have essentially an infinitely reusable score pad? And so we're surveying that. Currently, it doesn't look like there's quite enough interest to make one, but um, but maybe a small print run might be justified. But if you do have, want, want to weigh in with your opinion there, feel free to look for that in the Wingspan Facebook group. That's the main Stonemaier stuff today I have today. Or Stonemaier stuff I have today. I have a few other little things that I'll jump around and say, what was my video this past weekend? My video was about, I didn't write it down here. My video this past, oh, it was about time stories. Yeah, I did a video about my my rankings for the 11 Time Stories modules that I've played. Uh, I really love Time Stories. It's a cooperative adventure game. Uh, actually, it kind of relates to, um, to Matt's question a second ago, because there is written narrative in Time Stories, but they keep it to a, a nice sweet spot, and they add visuals to it. I really like the, the, the pairing of visuals plus a little bit of story, written narrative. I think that works out really well. Francesco says he's also playing a legacy game, My City, um, by Reiner Canizio uh, with, all, with his family, and he says he finds it delicious. I am excited to play My City. I, I haven't been able to get, get a copy yet, 
but um, and I need to probably wait a little bit because we have Pandemic Legacy Season Zero, and then I think um, uh, the new Ryan Lockett game that I backed a while ago, which which is another campaign game, uh, uh, Sleeping Gods. I think that's coming fairly soon after that. So, but after that, I'll probably give my city a try because it really does look like a lot of fun. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Let's see. Critchy says she's looking for two games, Lost Arnak and Bonfire. Can't seem to find them anywhere. Yeah, Critty, I had a really hard time trying to find this, but I someone last week in last week's uh, live cast recommended Atomic Empire in North Carolina. So I, they're a local game store in North Carolina. I couldn't find it at local game stores here in St. Louis or online stores, but they had a copy. Might want to check that out in case they still have extra copies. Tim says, is there a download link for a Tuscany Euphoria crossover? Uh, so this was kind of a secret thing that we included. It's no longer secret, but it's a little secret thing that we included in the original Tuscany, which were these uh, buildings, these structure cards that were um, a, a crossover into the Euphoria world. And there isn't a download link for that, Tim. We haven't had people ask about that for a long time. There, it, I imagine if you post on Board Game Geek, probably would be the best place for it, and ask people uh, if they if they use those cards, you will find someone who says we don't want to use those cards because they are. It's a little bit of a weird design for structure cards. They're different than the normal structure cards, and I'm guessing most people don't actually play with them. Um, in fact, I don't think I've played with mine for a while. I need to kind of find mine and shuffle them back in. I don't know where mine are, um, but yeah, I bet you can find someone who doesn't need them, and you can just get them from that person. Justin says that he really enjoyed Arnak and he played it over the weekend. David says, what have been my biggest surprises in gaming in 2020? Uh, yeah, there was a, a Dice Tower video about their biggest surprises the other day. There's been a lot of surprises. I mean, uh, most of the games that will end up on my top 10 list were surprises to me. Games that I didn't know about that I uh, really knew nothing about. Uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak could end up on that list. I, I and. I didn't. I, I knew nothing about it earlier in the year. Dune Imperium was a huge surprise. Even after I heard about it, I was like, it, it it didn't jump out to me. But then I played it and I absolutely loved it. I would say the biggest overall surprise to me has been Board Game Arena, a platform, not a specific game. I was aware of Board Game Arena before this year, but um, I had never really tried it. And this year, it has been become critical to my gaming because I can I can't host game nights in person this year. And so it, it's been a wonderful platform to be able to play games with people uh, with uh, an intelli a semi-intelligent system that helps us with scoring and, and the rules of the game and things like that. So Board Game Arena probably has been the biggest surprise to me. What about anybody else? What, what's been your biggest surprise in gaming this year? Whether it's a specific game, a style of play, a platform like Board Game Arena, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Mary says, if I were, if I were to order my little side today um, and, hol and hold it, uh, and hold it arrive in Massachusetts by Christmas. Mary, I'm sorry. I, I, I appreciate you asking about that, but our fulfillment center um, is is really backed up for the holidays. And uh, so I, at, at this point, I think there is little chance that they will be able to ship it out. You can try um, because like I mentioned earlier, the wingspan shipment that they were expecting um, is still at port. It has not arrived yet. And so all those orders that my, my fulfillment center was planning to, to do are not arriving now. And so they are focused on other orders. So it is possible, but I think pretty unlikely at this point. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, you can still give it a shot and try, but I think it's pretty unlikely. James Hudson's joining us from California. James, I was just talking earlier that I joined the Quackalo podcast for an hour long discussion about Tidal Blades the other day. Um, usually I'm on those podcasts to talk about my games, but uh, but it was a pleasure to talk about Tidal Blades for a while with him because I really did enjoy my first play of it and look forward to playing it again. Rafal says, uh, can you please recommend what should my next expansion to Viticulture be after Tuscany? I'm aware of more visitors designed by me and Uwe Rosenberg, me, and visit from the Rhine Valley. Yeah, those are the two. I mean, I would say Rafal... Um, so they're, they're two very different, well, they're two very similar, but but also very different expansions. Visit from the Rhine Valley is designed around the idea that if you want players to always have to go through the winemaking process to get victory points, um, and to enough victory points to win the game, get Visit from the Rhine Valley. Those visitor cards are designed around that concept. They are not shuffled in with the original cards. Instead, when you play with Visit from the Rhine Valley, you don't play with any of the other visitor cards. 
more visitors is just more visitor cards with a variety of new uh, mechanisms introduced by Uwe Rosenberg and kind of refined by me so they work well in viticulture. And those have a variety of things. So if you like the way viticulture plays right now where you can get victory points from a variety of different methods, I would get more visitors. If you want people to always have to make wine to get victory points, go with Visit from the Rhine Valley. Uh, Mo asked for news on the viticulture expansion. Yeah, we have hinted that we have a new viticulture expansion in the works that I'll talk about hopefully later next year. Uh, let's see. Beth says that she can never, she's talking about chocolate. She says she can never fail with sea salt lint truffles. Those do sound delicious, Beth. Uh, Critchy says, I want to thank you for sending Thinker Themer, which is a, uh, a YouTube channel, a wonderful YouTube channel, um, a copy of Scythe. She says, I love their reviews and I wanted to play Scythe, so everything clicked together. Amy took longer as she painted the miniatures. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Amy and Maggie are the two are, uh, people who run Thinker Themer. And uh, one of them, I forget which one is, I think Amy, yeah, okay, uh, Maggie, I believe, is the thinker. And so she looks at games from kind of an analytical perspective, uh, optimization perspective, and Amy loves the theme of games. And so they talk about those two perspectives on their channel. I highly recommend it. Critty, thank you for, for mentioning it on, on the live cast today, because they are, they're really wonderful. I am happy to send them any game to talk about on their channel whenever they want. Uh, Kevin's joining us. Hey, Kevin. He's just chiming in to say Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Thanks. The same to you. James says, who likes writing rule books? <laughs> I do. Once I get into the flow of it, I really do enjoy it. I, I like applying that structure to it. But I, it's always, uh, I, I procrastinate a little bit to start working on a, a new rule book. Uh, all right. Let's, I'll jump back to my topics in a minute. Then I'll come back to questions. A um, few things I'm excited about this week. Uh, Tenet. Uh, the, the new Christopher Nolan movie. I'm really excited that I can finally watch it in the, the safety of my home. Um, I will be happy to pay whatever cost it is to, to watch it streaming. And so I plan on doing that. I think it actually comes out or came out yesterday. We'll be doing that for movie night this weekend. I'm really excited about that. We've also been watching Legend of Korra season three, which is fantastic. It continues to amaze me how good that show is. Really, really good. And we just started watching The Orville. Which, uh, which is on Hulu, and I'm really enjoying it. I, I am not a big Star well, not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm not a Star Trek fan, but I haven't gotten into Star Trek. And Orville is kind of like Star Trek, but with a little, little more humor at times. Um, sometimes juvenile humor, but I like a little, little dose of juvenile humor. And it's really good. The, we've watched some episodes that have posed some huge moral questions and addressed them in really interesting ways, and we're only five episodes in. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, yeah, I think those are the two things, the various things that I've been watching recently. Uh, Rafal says, uh, further to you in regards to the, my recent video on time stories, how do you compare the whole series to RPG games or various modern escape room board games? RPG games, uh, so I don't have much experience with role-playing games, but with role-playing games, there's a lot of, uh, like a lot of the things that are being created or told or done are coming from the imaginations of the GM uh, or the dungeon master or the players. Um, whereas in time stories, it's all mechanical. It's all in the game. It's all written narrative. As for modern escape room games, I have played some of those. I've played a few of the unlocks. I've played um, the uh, the werewolf experiment, escape room in a box. I love them. I think they're great. Uh, time stories is my favorite. I, I do just enjoy that, uh, that format more because it is, uh, it's, I, I would say because it's a little less puzzly. Um, I like some puzzles in my games, but I don't like like a constant stream of puzzles. Um, and so I think Time Stories does a great, nice balance between a few puzzles and then a lot of other interesting choices to make where you have to pay attention to the narrative, um, some mechanical moments, things like that. Brett says, isn't there a free scoring app for, for, for Wingspan from a third party? Yes, there is. Yeah, uh, that was one of the options on the poll. Some people just prefer using scoring apps. Jake says, have I seen Paulo Mori's Blitzkrieg? Uh, I really, really want to play Blitzkrieg, but I haven't been able to get a copy yet. Um, he, let's see, Jake says, I'll just read what Jake's comment here. He says, it's a Twilight Struggle, Watergate, tug of war style, two player game that takes about 20 minutes. He also says in the rule book, he took the game to a war game publisher because he wanted their audience to be exposed to streamlined board game mechanisms 
in hopes that it would attract them to try a bigger variety of board games. Um, yeah, that sounds awesome. I, I've been wanting to play it for a long time, but I haven't seen it come back in stock for a long time now. I don't, I don't know if the publisher isn't making more copies or if they, it's just been delayed by the pandemic, but I've been waiting to get a copy. Um, I, I'd really, really like to play that. Uh, Jerk Jacob says, would you consider documenting a game making process from idea to finished product? Maybe let us follow the process live. Uh, I probably wouldn't let you do it, follow it live because I tend to keep things under wrap until we have finished production for a game. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a lot to document. I'll be honest. It's a lot to document. And so the way that I currently do this is through our design diary posts. So if you look on the Stomire Games Facebook or website, um, under certain games, you will see design diaries. Pretty much anything since Charterstone, or starting with Charterstone and after that, you'll see design diary series where you can read pretty detailed posts about um, various decisions that, that went into the design process. It's not completely step-by-step, -step, but I do have a video about that. I have 10 steps about how to, about 10 steps to design a tabletop game. That video is on YouTube now. It is not example driven as I think you're looking for, but it, it's essentially what you're, it's a little abstracted version of what you're asking for. Sean says, my camera keeps adjusting. Yeah, the, uh, on Facebook's platform, I don't think there's a way for me to, um, to have it not continually autofocus. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to not move around so the camera can just stay on me. Michael says, are English retailers still on course to ship the Oceania expansion on the 18th of this month? Uh, as far as I know, yes. I mean, it, it depends a lot on whether or not distributors uh, ordered on time and uh, have processed the games in a timely manner. As far as I know, of most distributors that I'm aware of, they have done this. And probably the retailers already have their copies of the games. There's one distributor that I know was a little behind and uh, probably will be too late to get their games to their uh, retailers. And I know of one retailer that we work with where my fulfillment center messed up a little bit and they are shipping to that retailer today. Um, so th there's it's one of the bigger retailers that we sell directly to. So uh, for the most part, yeah, but Michael, it does depend on your retailer and it depends on their distributor. Miles says that Board Game Arena is his biggest surprise in addition to his gaming for sure as well. Yeah. Uh, Tim says he bought Isle of Cats with it, without any prior knowledge and has received a lot of play from him this year. That's been a, a big surprise. Yeah, it seems I was looking at my the list that I'm slowly working on for my top 10 list of 2020, but I, I won't make that list until 2020 is over. But Isle of Cats, it feels like years ago that it came out, but it came out earlier this year. Same with Glenmore Chronicles 2 uh, or Glenmore 2. That came out earlier this year, but it seems like forever ago that it came out. It's, that's not a knock on the game. Just it's been a very long year. Donnie says his favorite, uh, his biggest surprise has been playing games physically via video. Um, and he's been surprised that that's been a lot of fun compared to playing many digital versions of video games, uh, vi digital versions of, of board games. He says, for example, I played Castle Panic with a friend where he was controlling the pieces and he had a blast. Uh, he played Dice Throne remotely as well. Yeah, it's great that you found a way to do that. It, it, it is possible certain games, it's harder with some than others. Um, I did a video about this earlier, right at the beginning of the pandemic games that you can play over Zoom and, and video. Um, and I'm glad you found some games that, that work for you to do that, Donnie. Kenneth says, on my last, last live stream, he asked what game to get between Scythe and Tapestry. He says he went with both of them and they have, and he's waiting for them for Christmas. That's awesome, Kenneth. Um, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for not making a decision there and getting both of them. That's great. Shadi says, I can't remember if you found the Hobbit version of Lord of the Rings Love Letter, but I know you've been looking for it. Um, I did find it. I, I posted about this uh, earlier in the year and someone very kindly reached out and sent me their copy because they weren't playing their copy anymore. So I do now have a Love Letter version of the Hobbit and I love it. It's definitely my favorite version of Love Letter. Um, and Shadi then offers to send me his copy. That's very kind of you. Thank you for offering that. But I do, I do have a copy now. And so I hope you can enjoy your copy. Zach says, how do I think, uh, what do I think about the pandemic legacy games at two players? Do they have an alpha player possibility like the base game or do they do anything to negate that a bit? Um, so Zach, I have played most pandemic legacies with actually five or six players. Um, we've kind of teamed up for the characters. It's technically a four player game. But um, Megan and I have been playing pandemic legacy season zero with two players 
and we are just respectful of each other and don't alpha player each other. Uh, we let each other make their decisions, and if we see that the other player is struggling a little bit, I might say, um, Megan, have you thought about doing this? Or she is better at the game than I am, and so she often chimes in and says, uh, you know, might want to think twice about doing that, but ultimately it's my decision or it's her decision when it's her turn. So um, I don't need the game to not make me an alpha player. I just choose not to be. And I'm glad Megan does the same. Chad says, sounds like many people really like Castles of Tuscany since it's a simpler and faster version of Castles of Burgundy, but with some differences. You've already done this with My Little Scythe. Ever considered making more games like this? That's great to hear about Castles of Tuscany. I haven't gotten to play that yet. Uh... I haven't, no, I haven't really considered that about our games. We kind of went the opposite direction with Between Two Cities. We had Between Two Cities and we made a heavier version of it in Between Two Castles. But I haven't considered that with my other games. I mean, my focus with all games is to make them very easy for someone to, to learn and to onboard new players into the experience. So hopefully uh, we can accomplish that goal with a variety of games and don't need to make like simpler versions of our games. Jake says, did you say that Viticulture will have a new expansion? Yeah, on the progress chart that we post on our monthly e-newsletter, I mentioned a month or so ago, I started listing that there is a Viticulture expansion in the works. I haven't said anything about it or when it's coming out or anything like that, but uh, just that it's in the works and it's kind of on target for 2021. I don't know if that'll actually end up happening, but that's our current target. Uh, Bojan says, uh, have I seen Queen's Gambit? Would you like to see another board game themed show? I haven't seen board game, uh, Queen's Gambit yet. It is on our queue to watch. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to watch shows about board games. Melissa from Room 51 says, I've heard of the house rule for Viticulture to draw two wine orders and choose to discard the other one. What do I think of this? I personally don't care to, but was curious what you think of it. Melissa, my general thought about house rules is that... Um, I design the game the way that I think it is the most fun and the best way to play it. And I'd recommend people play it that way. However, if someone has more fun with a rule that they make on their own, ultimately I design games so people can have fun with them. And so if that brings more joy to people, they can do that. The reason in Viticulture that you don't do that is A, it slows down the game because you have to wait for a player to make a, a draw decision every time they draw some cards. And B, Viticulture is a tactical, it's, it's a strategic game that you have to plan ahead. But it's also a tactical game in that you need to make decisions based on the cards that you draw. And you draw an abundance of cards in Viticulture. The game is constantly giving you more and more cards. And so you have to decide from this abundance of cards which ones are the best ones for you to use at any given moment. And uh, so I, I really, I, as house rules go, I discourage players from using that house rule because it, it directly contradicts the design flow of the game and that you, you should be drawing one card and adding that to your hand of many cards and pivoting if you need to and, and making decisions based on the things that you're given rather than making the decision point at the point of drawing the card. So it's just kind of a different decision point. You're not deciding which card to draw. You're deciding how to use the many different cards that you have drawn. Tatan says, what was your favorite news from the Disney plus Marvel announcements recently? Um, I mean, I was kind of surprised at the sheer abundance of them. Uh, I love that they have like, I think it was like 10 Marvel shows and 10 um, Star Wars shows that they're coming out with. Uh, so part of me saw that and I was like, I just want them to get them right one at a time uh, because Mandalorian has been amazing. I loved, I've been loving the Mandalorian, uh, but I'm glad they didn't come out with like 20 Star Wars shows right off the bat because probably a lot of them wouldn't have worked and maybe one or two would have worked. So I'd rather them be very methodical with this, but it sounds like they, they kind of are. Disney knows what they're doing. Uh, what was I most excited about? Uh, I mean, WandaVision I'm excited about because I think it's the next one to come out. Uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier I'm excited about. I think there's one that I'm forgetting here that I would... Oh, Loki. I'm probably the most excited about the Loki show. I knew about that before, but I am excited about that. Keith says, how do I think it's a step forward to do a how to play video alongside a rule book for future board games? Uh, I think people learn games in different ways. And so um, one of the ways to, to learn a game is from the rule book and another way is from the, the how to play video. And so that's one of the reasons that whenever we have a new game come out, I contract uh, Rodney, I watch it played if Rodney is willing to do it, uh, to make a how to, pl how to play rules video. And, um, and I, you know, I, I make the rule book. But uh, yeah, I think the two go hand in hand. I think it's great when there are people like Rodney 
who who you can hire to make a wonderful how to play rule book, how to play rule rule video for a game. So I think the two go hand in hand. Critty says my family really enjoys the light, lightweight games like Fantastic Factories, Camel Up, Sushi Go Party, uh, Sushi Go Party. Any good trending recommendations? Um, I really enjoy On Tour. I think On Tour is really easy to teach and play. Uh, you're in Seattle. I can see it. Fantastic Factories, I think, was designed by a few guys in Seattle. Um, I think Cartographers is actually pretty easy to teach. Downforce, I think, is really easy to teach. Scotland Yard. I'm looking at games on like one specific sector of my shelf over here because they all fall into, into that category. Yeah, I think those, those might be a, some, some good starting points. Downforce, Scotland Yard. On tour and cartographers. I think those are all really. Oh, and Sagrada. I think Sagrada is, is great too. I have a video coming out this weekend that's about games that you can uh, stop playing at any time. Like if you get cut off, say you're you're gathering together with your ha- with your family for the holidays and dinner's ready and you have to stop playing the game that you started. That uh, that it's easy to to just cl- close up the game and stop playing and still have had a satisfying experience from what you did and accomplished in that game. So that video is coming out this Sunday. Uh, Tim says, uh, he says, I'm excited excited about, actually Tim reveals something that I I don't know if I meant to reveal in the past or something, you know, it's not that, it's that uh, Tim, there might be some confusion here. You said you're excited about the Viticulture Big Box. There isn't actually a Viticulture Big Box. I've said that we are considering making the new Viticulture expansion box big enough to maybe hold all Viticulture stuff, but it's definitely not something that we've announced or said we're officially doing yet. Something we're just considering. Um, yeah, that's just what, but I think you may have misheard, like you seem to be speaking about a Viticulture big box to hold everything or a Viticulture version of Viticulture with all Viticulture stuff in one box, all gameplay stuff, and neither of those things are, are happening. So you may have misheard that before. Sorry if I said something confusing. Uh, Par says, have I heard of Destinies from Lucky Duck Games? It's a competitive story-driven game of adventure and exploration. I have. Yeah, I backed it. I am uh, just waiting to get my Kickstarter copy. I have, have they delivered it yet? Because um, I don't think I've heard heard about it in a little while. But I am eager to get my copy whenever it's ready. Jake says he had to get Blitzkrieg directly from Plastic Soldier Company in the UK since he had the same experience with trying to get it. Well, maybe I'll have to do the same thing, Jake. I don't necessarily want to ship all the way from the UK if I can help it, but uh, maybe that's the way to go. Uh, Yeah, I'll make a note about that and take care of that today. Or maybe I'll also look on Board Game Geek to see if anyone's selling their copy. Joshua says, you may have been, you may have asked this in the past, but do you know your Enneagram number? Thoughts on it? I've been loving researching it lately. I... I, I have taken the Enneagram test survey thing, but I don't remember my number. Um, it, I, I, for Myers-Briggs, though, I do know my Myers-Briggs number. I am an INTJ, a very low introvert, low, what was N standing for? I don't know what the N stands for. Um, and high thinker, high, I think, uh, judger, judgment, whatever the last one is. So high, low I, low N, high T, high J. Ryan says that he just got my favorite Time Stories module yesterday, Prophecy of Dragons. I hope you really enjoy it, Ryan. Um, I'm a little jealous that, that anyone gets to play that for the first time because I just had a, such a wonderful experience playing Prophecy of Dragons for the, one of the, the Time Stories modules. Beth says that Quacks of Quinlanburg was her surprise this year. She said she had heard it was fun but was surprised how easy it is to teach and how much family and new gamers end up really loving it. Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. Uh, that's one that could answer Kriti's question earlier about what type of game you might want to introduce to a family who wants slightly lighter games, but not completely light games. Sean says, is Stillmeyer going to make any special Christmas items? Uh, this would be for next holiday season, because we're if we wanted to make anything for this Christmas, we would have had to start making it back in probably June. Um, but no, we don't have any plans to do anything special for Christmas. George says, what do you think about games, about GameFound in comparison with Kickstarter? I think in the near future, they will be a serious competitive player for Kickstarter and crowdfunding. George, I have detailed thoughts about that on a blog post I wrote a few weeks ago, maybe even a month ago at this point. So search the Stonemaier Games blog for GameFound. I talk about it really in detail there. But overall, I am excited about the things they're trying. And I think of any 
a platform that will potentially compete with the Kickstarter in terms of gaming, I think it is GameFound. I think they've really put in the work to, to possibly make that happen. Not that Kickstarter really needs a competitor, but I think it could benefit from it. And to have a platform designed for gamers, I think could be really, really cool. Let's see, Zach says, last week, I think last week you said somewhere I was hoping to have two new games early next year. Or not early next year, ready next year. Not necessarily early. Would that likely be quarter one of the year? Um, it really depends. Yeah, I, it, you can kind of look on our progress chart on our website to see what we're estimating. But um, but we, yeah, we haven't re- announced any release dates. This is kind of, uh, I, I know we have two games that we, two games that we'll be releasing in 2021. And um the exact time of them, I, I don't know at this point. But I can say that next year, we, we really focused on people's budgets. Um, we still, I think, have made some, some beautiful games, beautiful products for next year, but we've tried to be really uh, 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 conscientious of people's limited budgets right now, especially during a tough economy. Edgar just says, I hope everything's going well. Thanks, Edgar, for saying that. Let's see if I missed any topics this week. I think I've covered everything that I was going to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, So I will just answer questions for the rest of the live cast. Sarah says that uh, she saw someone talk about a video, a Forex video game called Humankind. She says it reminded her a lot of tapestry in that you start out with a Neolithic civilization and you work your way through the eras, choosing how your culture evolves. That sounds pretty cool. I'm going to make a note of that. Humankind. Yeah, thank you for the recommendation, Sarah. I don't play a lot of video games, but I love learning about video games um, because they definitely inspire my designs, my tabletop game designs all the time. Jake says that Wingspan has been confirmed on Nintendo Switch. Um, have I played the port much at all? No, I actually have not played the, uh, the, the Monster Couch version of Wingspan yet. Um, I need to. I, I definitely need to because it, look, it looks beautiful. Um, I don't have a Nintendo Switch, so I'll be playing it on Steam whenever I get to play it. Uh, Par says, uh, oh, he has, he's, he's sharing some, some best moments of 2020. He mentioned Viticulture. Uh, thank you for mentioning Viticulture there. And Raiders of Scythia, or Scythia. Nice. Good picks. Good picks there. Jake, another Jake. Lots of Jakes today. Jake says that he has a house rule for Scythe. Uh, people, are, yeah, it's, I gotta say, it's, it's, I, I love that people have house rules that bring them more joy. It's a little weird to bring up with a designer because obviously the designer for any game has designed the game the best way that they think it's going to be played. And, uh, so I appreciate house rules. I usually don't pay attention to them all that much though, but, uh, you're welcome to talk about them amongst yourselves in the, in the game design forums. Let's see here. Chad says, I have a group of friends that invited me to play Diplomacy Online with them. I hear that it's a friend killer. Ever played? What are your thoughts on the game? I actually have not played Diplomacy. I've seen it played at one of our design days, but I haven't played it myself. Um, I, I guess I need to. I probably should. I, I know all about it, but I just haven't played it because I don't want to have a friend killing game. But I have heard that same thing about it. Probably depends on your friends. Joshua says, I backed a button shy's recently recent Ugly Griffin in Kickstarter and have joined their Board Game of the Month Club. Have I played button shy games before? Thoughts on them or the club? I have played some button shy games. I think uh, my coworker Joe was a member or is a member of that club. I uh, I don't need a new game every month from the same company, but I do really, really enjoy Hierarchy. I really enjoy Tussie Mussy, and I enjoyed Sprawlopolis, Sprawlopolis as well. My, my top two there are definitely Tussie Mussy and Hierarchy. Both are fantastic games. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a neat business model and, and seems to be working for them. I just don't need that many. I, I don't need that constant flow of, uh, of, of tiny games. And I like to be able to choose the games that, that, I, that I want. Let's see. Uh, another uh, INTJ here with uh, Barry says he's an, a fellow INTJ. He says he's looking forward to getting the Tapster expansion. What is your favorite new card or building in it? Um, so this is the Tapster Plans and Ploys expansion. That's the newest expansion. My favorite ca- new card or building. Well, I really do like the new card uh, type, which is uh, the, the landmark cards. The landmark cards give each player a little short-term goal early in the game, something to focus on. 
And I, I love putting those landmarks in my capital city. So I really enjoy that part of it. Jake is also an INTJ. Let's see. Park confirms that uh, Destiny is from Lucky Duck is up for a tw March 2021 release. Okay. Nice. Edgar says he got Lost Ruins of Arnak. This is the game that I'm really looking forward to playing this weekend. He's already played it three times. Uh, oh, so Edgar, yeah, you may have missed the beginning. I, I did finally get a copy. I haven't played it yet, but I have a scheduled game this Sunday to play it. I'm really, really excited about that. But I haven't played it yet. Chance says, have I played Pipeline? I have played Pipeline once with, with Henry um, and a few others. I think Henry taught it. He says, that game is amazing to me how it blends a super mathy Euro style with a spatial puzzle that requires a completely different skill set. I find it super hard to do well at, but I'm really enjoying trying to figure out how to play it well. Yeah, that's true. It has a, a, a puzzle. I think it's something kind of like what Uwe Rosenberg does with some of his games, where he has a, a polyomino puzzle um, and then a, other completely different aspects of the game. Like in A Feast for Odin, I would compare it a little bit to Feast for Odin, where you have this polyamino puzzle, and then you also have a, wor a huge worker placement puzzle, and you have the Feeding Your Workers puzzle. Lots of different puzzles in Ufa Rosenberg games. But I have played Pipeline once, and I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I, it wasn't one that I was excited to return to, but I thought they did a, a good job with it. A solid game. And I can see that you would like it. It's a little heavier for me. Let's see. Edgar says, on the Stomar website, I like this phrase which world will you visit today yeah I, I like that phrase too um now i'm curious are all of your worlds all of your games are in different worlds any plans on making new games set in any of these worlds you've already built or will the adventures continue solely in expansions yeah people i, I know people love connected worlds people have asked about this a few times um, i love brandon sanderson's fiction series where everything is a little bit connected but in our games Trying to think of what we have coming up. Everything is separate so far. No, we, we haven't had any overlapping worlds. Um, so I, I, currently there aren't, there aren't plans to, to have uh, uh, games share the same space. I think the most likely for that to happen would be in the Scythe world, a completely new game in the Scythe universe. Um, but that's the only one I can, I can think of as a, as a distinct possibility at this point. Roland is an INTP. He says, board games seem to attract INT type personalities. Yeah. Chad says, what was my favorite national park that you visited and the national park that I would most like to visit? That's a fun question. I have still, um, I've been to many beautiful places uh, in the US, but Bryce Canyon is the most beautiful place that I've ever been in the US, maybe in the world. Stonehenge is definitely up there, although Stonehenge isn't a, a natural beauty like Bryce Canyon is. It is natural, but it's, it's you know, man-made. Um, and there are a few places in New Zealand that were, that were absolutely stunning, but Bryce Canyon was incredible. As for national parks I want to visit, um, I'd like to go to Yosemite. I'd really like to see Yosemite and Arches. Arches sounds really, really cool and almost otherworldly. Which one would you recommend, Chad? Do you, do you have a favorite that you think I should visit or think that other people should visit other national parks in the U.S.? Or anyone who's not in the U.S. If you have a, a park, a national park type place in your country that you think is a must-see, a place that just took your breath away when you first saw it, um, I, I, I'd love to check it out. John says, what single game are you looking forward to most on Kickstarter right now? Have I played any of the Awakened Realms games? I have played um, Tainted Grail. I played Tainted Grail, but I haven't played their other, their other games yet. What am I looking for? What, what do I have? I'll see what I'm backing on Kickstarter right now. I don't think it's a ton of things that I'm actively backing. Uh, David says, have I played Project L? What are my favorite polyomino games? I actually have a full video about this, David. If you go to my YouTube channel, there are a lot of polyomino and Tetris style games that I enjoyed enough so for me to take, make a full, full video about them. I do love A Feast for Odin. I love Blockus. I love Patchwork. Um, yeah, uh, cartographers. I think I forgot to put cartographers on the list, but it should have been on that list. I do have, I played Project L once. I do own it um, and I do enjoy it. But uh, yeah, only played it once so far. What is, what am I backing on Kickstarter right now? I am backing Momiji. I'm backing Momiji. And I think that's the only active project I'm backing right now, Momiji. Mark says that he recently played the Rise of Fenris with seven players all the way through. That's awesome, Mark. 
He says they're going to repeat it with the airships and the modular board in the mix when COVID passes. Good luck with the modular board there. Rise of, Fen Rise of Fenders wasn't designed for use with the modular board. It is possible, but you might run into some wacky scenarios. So be ready for some wacky things to happen if you do that. Uh, Francesco's taken off. Kim says she's an INFP. We're talking about Myers-Briggs acronym. See if you're familiar with that uh, personality survey. Jake says Yosemite Grand Teton and Glacier are his favorite parks. I have been to Glacier. I've done a did a long hike as a kid in Glacier National Park. Danny says, which visitors expansion for viticulture would you recommend? Would I recommend for visitors? A uh, visit from the Rhine Valley or more visitors? Hmm. I would say they're both, I mean, they're both the same kind of difficulty level. Uh Rhine Valley is neat because it does encourage you to go through the entire winemaking process. So if you're teaching the game and you want someone to really learn that process, uh, Rhine Valley does a great job of doing that. More Visitors is just kind of more things to consider. I would say More Visitors is maybe a little heavier than Rhine Valley. So you might go with Rhine Valley. Slight edge. George says, what games are you planning to play for Christmas this year? So we will be with a very small group of people, a few members of Megan's family this year. We'll, we're going to get together. They're going to join us for Christmas. And so we'll play some games that play at uh, slightly higher play player counts than we're used to. I have uh, Fossilis is on my list. It's a new game that I want to play with them. I think that'll be fun. And I don't know what else. I will probably bring some just random games that I enjoy that play up to uh, five or six people. Mysterium Park I'm definitely going to bring out. I definitely I need to put Mysterium Park on that pile. Edgar says he likes the Wednesday live sit downs or stand ups. I'm standing up right now. Um, he says it means a lot to me, especially that here in the Netherlands, we are in day two of a five week severe lockdown. Um, it means the world to me, especially living alone. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Edgar. And I'm, I'm sorry you're in complete lockdown right now. I know, I know that's uh, it's a uh, it's a tough time um, to, to be alone and, and to be uh, uh, and to feel alone. Um, so I'm glad uh, we can be here live to 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 chat with you today and thanks for thanks for joining the conversation chad says there's a national park here in michigan called hartwick pines i don't think i've heard of that one it has ancient pines that were not cut down during the logging era beautiful huge trees he says he'd also like to see the redwoods in california you know there's one place in california that i've never been able to find and maybe this is just made up but i've heard there's a place that where gravity acts a little differently and you can kind of like lean back and feel something magnetic or a little different that might be completely made up but i feel like i heard about that as a kid and i've been wanting to find that ever since but i don't know what it is or how to look it up even or how to find it so if anyone knows about a national park in california where or, or somewhere on the pacific northwest pacific coast where gravity is a little weird uh let me know i'd love to go there someday gary says have i played dwellings of eldervale no but i've seen a lot of buzz about it right recently a lot of videos coming out about it um i've not played it not played it yet. Roland has taken off for the holidays. Thanks for, for stopping by, Roland. Uh, Bojan says that's Gravity Falls in Oregon. So it is a real place. Really? Okay. Well, that is going on my bucket list because that sounds amazing. I love places that are just a little otherworldly. Um, and that sounds really cool. I, I'd love to go there. Have you been there, Bojan? I, what, have you? Yeah, What? what is it? Jake says, in Australia, we have many wineries that, smell, that sell small card games for tourists, and one cellar door manager wanted to get viticulture in their cellar door for weekend visitors to try out. Have I ever had any wineries approach you to bundle the game with their own product pack, packages? Um, I guess two different things there. One is we have sold to some wineries. I, I think maybe most of the people that go to wineries aren't looking for like a medium weight Euro game, and so we haven't had a lot of the success with that, but I love, and we were happy to sell to any wineries that want to carry our games. As for bundling it, we haven't considered that, but I would love someday to do a small batch, like a one barrel, make a barrel of wine for viticulture fans and have label the wine bottles with viticulture labels. Um, I, I think that'd just be something cool to do for viticulture fans. So I'd love to do that someday. Um, it's slightly different than the bundle, but that's something that I, I hope to do someday. Critty, good luck with your exam. She says, Merry Christmas if I'm una unable to join you next week. Um, she always watches our live sessions in her leisure time because they are on Facebook later. Or they will be on Facebook later. They'll also be on YouTube later. But yeah, have a good, a good week and good luck with your exam. Uh, Tyler says that there's a place called Gravity Hill in Pennsylvania. Okay, another place where gravity is a little weird. 
cool. David says that Yosemite Arches and Canyonlands are his favorites. There's a rim hike in Canyonlands that was amazing. I haven't heard, actually heard of Canyonlands. I'll have to check that out. Uh, Gary says that he really enjoyed his first play, or uh, his play, first play, multiple plays of Dwellings of Eldervale. Um, it's a weird one in that I, it looks beautiful. I haven't figured out exactly from the videos what makes it so special um, in terms of gameplay. So I, I guess I need to play it to find out. That's the only way to really figure out if, if I can't figure that out from the, the videos. Because that was, was the same way with me with Dune Imperium. I watched a bunch of videos about it. I was like, I don't quite get it. But then I played it and it blew me away. Uh, Andrew says, Viticulture wine, take my money now. Well, we got to make the wine first, <laughs> Andrew. Cool. All right. Well, I think I've reached the end of the comments here. Um, oh, Tim says, it's really about optical illusions more than gravity. Uh, for that, the moon works. <laughs> okay. I see, I see. So maybe it's not actually a, a difference in gravity, but just optical illusions. Okay. I can see that. But uh, thank you for joining me today. And I will hopefully join you at least for a few minutes next week. Next week will be the 23rd of December. I'll kind of be in the middle of the holidays at that point. But but I'll try to pop on for a little bit, maybe on my phone to to jump in here for a live guest and say hi. If you have any follow-up questions that you think of after this video, feel free to pop over to YouTube and put them there. I'll put the video there and I get better notifications on YouTube. So take care, stay safe, have a good week, and I'll see you next week. Bye.